Perfect, excellent. We're going to turn it over, folks, on the GoToWebinar. You are still going to be able to participate in this session, so I'm going to turn it over to the Shrine team here to walk you through the process. Guys on the phone, um, so we have a Google form set up for you to get your feedback. So hopefully you can see the link in the chat window, or Elena is going to email everybody. Um, my uh, colleague Catherine is going to go through the wireframe, so she's going to just pace herself and try to go through each um, reveal each the next step of the wireframe. So I'll hand it over to her. Thanks, Everyone, um, my name is Catherine. Um, if you guys can please click on the Google form, um, this is what you'll be filling out um, as I go along the concept, and I'll try to go as slow as I can. Um, I'm not sure if you can write into the chat, but if you um, if you can write into the chat, please let me know um, when I can move forward. If not, I'll just kind of keep going on to the next page. So on the very first, um, first part of the page, I want you to go through the con the form. And we're going to go over the very first concept, concept A.
Hi, everyone. If you can hear me, this is Elena. Please, I know a few of you have my number. Send me a text message. Our chats haven't been going through to the whole group. They've only been going to organizers. try to go at a pace and, and hopefully um, we'll be able to catch up. So this is the very first concept, concept A. So we're going to take um, all of those criteria and we're going to enter it right into the queries. And how would you add the second query term, um, metaform in at least 500 milligrams? So you want to try to picture what the um, what the white frame might look like as you add it. And the question is, did the real white frame match what you've imagined? Did you understand where to place all six medication terms? So the second one. And then how would you see? And if you did understand where to place all six medication terms, so no, if it wasn't as you pictured, what did you imagine? Okay. Or on to the third query term. Um, just try to picture what the worker might look like as you add it. So when I reveal the wireframe, um, what did you imagine and understand how to add the lab value constraints? And if it was as you pictured, what did you imagine? This is for the lab constraints. This is lab constraints with um, all terms. to the fourth term. So the question is, how would you be able to add the fourth query term? And then just try to picture on the wireframe what might look like as you add it. And the question is, when I reveal the wireframe, what did you imagine? 
and uh, to understand how to create an exclusion group. And if it wasn't as you pictured, what did you imagine? The remaining questions are, what would you do next? And what do you like most about this concept? And what did you like least about this? Give it a few minutes and then we'll go to the next concept. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go on to the, the next concept. Okay, so looking at this very first page, what is the first thing you would do and how would you begin? And the next question is, how would you add the first query term, um, type 2 diabetes? Did the real wireframe match what you imagined? And if it wasn't as you pictured, what did you imagine? So the next question is, how would you add the second query term, metaformin, at least 500 milligrams? So you want to try to picture what the wireframe might look like as you add it. So there are a total of six terms, like the very first one. So as I'm going through this, while I'm re revealing the next steps, like is this what you've imagined? And do you understand where to place all six medication terms? And if, we're, what, um, if it wasn't as you pictured, what did you imagine doing instead? I right, give it, uh, that one a few more minutes and then um, a few more seconds and then I'll move on to the next one, to the next query. Right. Okay, so the next one is how would you reveal on um, the third term, uh, if it's a third term, and I want you to picture how you might want to add it. You kind of went a little too ahead. So as I'm revealing this, is this what you've imagined? And do you understand how to add a lab value constraint? It wasn't as you pictured, what did you imagine? Okay. So for the next one, for the fourth query term, um, try to picture what the wire might look like as you add it. Okay, as I reveal it, is it what you've imagined? 
And did you understand how to create an, an um, exclusion group? And if it wasn't as you pictured, what did you imagine? And then the remaining questions are what would you do next? And what did you like most about this concept? What did you like least? Great, so that sums everything up. Um, there are, um, in the form, there are a few other questions, just um, some general questions. You can also fill those out as well. Um, that'd be really helpful to us. And then once you're done, you can submit your form. So we're just going to wait a few more minutes to um, for the other teams to finish up. And um, I think once you can, when you once you do submit, I think you do have the ability to edit your form if you, if you um, forgot a few things. Thank you so much. I heard a lot of really great work. We'll heard a lot of great conversations happening at the table. Um, hopefully, you guys are able to get through all the contracts. Um, what will be really helpful is if you can make sure you fill out your sheet and give it to the facilitator at your table, and then um, that way our team can take this back and work on it and start and everything. Thank you again so much. Hope you guys enjoyed the session. Thank you. All right, folks, thank you for participating. Uh, with the Shrine 2020 breakout. Right now, we're going to switch gears here and talk a little bit about participant identification. So. Hi, everybody. I'm Vivian, if you don't already know me. We are going to talk about participant identification, and I'm just going to talk at you for a few minutes, and then we're going to have Two other people talk but we want to continue the spirit of the interaction so we allow a lot of time for discussion and feel free to jump in when you have questions so what is participant identification well it's our goal in act and it's to find subjects at local sites to enroll into clinical trials so on this slide, I've tried to distinguish between what we're doing at the network level and at the local level, and this hour is focusing on the local level, but I wanted to go over what the process is in general. And I should say that there are a lot of things that are left out of this, but this is a, a sort of a general idea of what, what we have to do. So first we have to figure out what the eligibility criteria are as we did in our last example. And we have to make that into a query at the network level. And once we have that query defined in the way that we like, we have to uh, run it across the network. Now we've run it across the network and we have to look and see, well, what sites do we want to work with and which ones have enough patients? And so, we have to identify locally the query that was used at the network level. And that may be a little bit harder than you think because there can be a lot of queries that were run at the network level. So we have to be able to find the one, the correct one. And then we will want to run the query locally. Once we do that, we have to get the patient. So 
Locally, we have I2D2 patient numbers, and we want to eventually get to a medical record number so that we can find the patient. So I want to thank all the people who participated in the survey because we got a great response. We got 40 sites participating. And what we found out is that most everybody said that they can they have an IRB approved process that allows them to get medical record numbers from clinical trials. That's without IDB2 and Shrine or anything. They're allowed to do this. That's great. And then most sites said that they have a mapping somewhere of IDB2 numbers to MRNs. It's also excellent. Uh, but only about 40% of sites said they already have a process in place. And many people said it was mostly manual. And some people said it's a combination of manual and automated. So we think that there's some work that we need to do. And we talked before about the claims that we are developing. Uh, what we think, what came out of the survey that sites wanted was a pipeline for doing the work to make it more efficient and the ability to identify the network query and then tools to help extract the identifiers. So we're going to talk about both of those things. Mitch Watson is going to talk about local tools and then Dave Wong from our team is going to talk about some new ideas we have for keeping track of all this stuff. So I'm gonna give the floor over to Mitch. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Uh, okay, so a bunch of these slides you've seen before, they're just kind of summarizing um, some of the work we've done before. But uh, so, of course, this is a, the ACT uh, network, and we're just going to concentrate on uh, your site that's connected to the ACT network and some of the tools that you can use to help um, your patient identification process. So at your local site, of course, you have Shrine and you have I2V2 installed. Um, and this slide is just representing some of the um, uh, segmentation of, of, of software that, that's already at your site. So in I2B2 generally, um, this is where your, your um, EHR data is stored. You have the local ontology um, where you handle your, your, your mappings if necessary. Uh, in the shrine, you have that network ontology that, that Michelle beautifully provides. Uh, and, and then of course in the shrine, you have, you have your set of local users. And um, the Shrine has a Shrine web client, and of course, uh, we've talked about um, some of the plans for Shrine 2020. And I2B2 also has um, its own local web clients that you've probably used when you're trying to set up I2B2 um, from the beginning. So we're just going to try to highlight um, the I2B2 web client a little bit. These, these are kind of where the plugins will run, at least these couple plugins that I'll talk about. Um, this slide here is just showing uh, what Vivian just mentioned about running a network query. You would do this iter iteratively. Um, this, so this is an investigator running uh, a shrine query. Um, they've gotten results back from uh, multiple sites in the app network. Uh, and so in this uh, scenario here, you know, maybe they've identified four sites that they want to work with or and, and um, they want those uh, sites to perform some local actions. And so essentially after you run your shrine query, once we have the network query, you know, what's next? So at the local level, we um, identified that we wanted to provide a tool to help find and review the exact network query. So this is kind of a thing we kind of skipped over, but uh, Doug mentioned it this morning. There's a flagging option in, inside the shrine that can kind of help at least pinpoint that that query um, is something to take action on. And uh, another tool to be able to get closer to that patient identification. So we provide a tool to be able to 
for you to be able to export the IPv2 patient numbers associated to that shrine query um, at your local site uh, very easily. And optionally for those um, sites, and this is kind of in the future, um, for sites that are set up um, in, in, you know, if those, all of the stars align, then providing them an ability to review patients on screen locally. So this is what the first plugin kind of looks like right now. Um, you basically are able to view all your shrine queries that have um, been run at your local site. So this is, this is, these are all the queries that your local site knows about. And I think this is really the only UI currently that you can see your actual shrine queries. Um, you, you know, like basically, these are all the incoming shrine queries, not just the queries that you've run, but these are the queries that your site has responded to. And up here, there's some basic search functionality. You can search by query name, user, uh, and, and you can show only five queries. And when you click um, the view query button, you can see you can see the query underneath um, that ran uh, from your shrine query originally. So these are this is just a, an example query here. And you can click export patients. So with one button, you can actually get um, currently a uh, Excel file with all the patient numbers associated to that query. Uh, this is just optionally, you can review patients on screen. Um, you've see, probably seen this before, but this is um, setting up if your site is capable to put in other data. And this is like a limited data set. And then in the future, um, you know, we, we ITV2 is capable of, of having identified data inside um, and managing user permissions to who can see um, these things. So this is kind of the far future about uh, what potentially you can get. So what's missing? <clears throat> so basically you run your query um, across the network, you found the aggregate account, uh, but in general, there's a workflow process that we've been working on. So we wanna see how to leverage the network to get your ideas out, uh, share and update your work. So the, these collaboration tools um, to be able to uh, collaborate with others and have contributions from others uh, tracked. And here you can also synchronize trial parameters to each side. So Dave's gonna actually talk about um, registering your clinical trials and, and, and a project called Sheriff. Sheriff, sorry. Okay, let's take a little break though, because I know um, we're gonna stop here for a second. So, um, this we're talking about the plugins, and uh, I think that most of you have seen these before. I presented them yesterday, and we presented them last year. We've been talking about them, but I just wanted to ask people: um, Do you, do you, what is your sense? I mean, do you think that these are going to be helpful? Are these going to answer the questions that you have? And I know that the pilot sites have installed and tried the plugins already. But and other people haven't had a chance, but I just thought we could talk about it for a few minutes. Uh, I'm hoping that what I said was the response to the survey is what people here felt, my summary. But if there are other things that um, you're thinking about, then I hope you'll bring that up here. So are there any questions or comments? Yeah. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> Um, because trying to find those queries in uh, so I'm very much looking forward to getting that. And, um, That's great. One question I do have about it is that for those of us that do leverage the patient tracking system, mm -hmm. is it possible to not just export the patient account, but the patient IDs from that table? That cuts out yet yeah, another step that we have to do because we can't do a lot of patient. Sure. So we have we have we have worked on the version that actually does that, um, but uh, we kind of had to uh, take a look at other sites. Basically, I don't think a lot of sites are actually using the patient mapping table. So the survey um, revealed that. So the so, so the first version that we're going to release 
right now concentrates on patient numbers, um, but certainly that's something that we've already looked at. So yes, for sure. Yes. The release. So right, so right now officially we've um, we we are bundling. So what we found as um, part of the installation process on the pilot size was that we kind of bundled everything together and it was kind of really hard and we've encountered a lot of issues. But um, we've bundled only the first two plugins right now. So it's the the one that exports patient nums and then the one that you can find the try and queries. Um, that, so that's released to the officially released to the pilot sites. Um, I think there is a zip file yeah, up on the wiki, but it wasn't announced yet. We're, we're rolling that out like really soon. It's there right now. A secret. <laughs> I was supposed to put a paywall and forty nine Not, not, yeah, I mean, not, not this version, but um, yeah, we have a working version of that. It just, it, it, yeah, sure. Yeah, in order for that to work, there's like a whole, um, there's more kind of prereqs, prereqs that need to be set up, so. Well, Elena knows the
different things were thrown out here just to clarify as far as release and rollouts and different versions for act for the rest of the year we will later this summer be uh swip, switching over to shrine 2.0 as doug alluded to earlier it will be going into the act test network here in the next couple of weeks and once it's there we'll have a better idea as to when we'll be rolling it out to stage and production but that will be later this summer. And then once we go through that, we will then move to I2B2 1.7.11. So that will be before the end of the year, but after Shrine 2.0, as soon as we have more information on exact dates, we will let you know. And then as far as the plugins, the technology is there. Everything is all well and good. We do have plans to have a communicated rollout um, that we're going to do in a phased approach. We are just working through some of the communication of that to make sure it's clear exactly, you know, what the the two plugins that at this point in time we're rolling, we're officially rolling out across ACT, what they do, who is the intended user. Just make sure we have our ducks in a row before we communicate that more broadly. Cool. Right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? So. And looking at the survey, what I saw is that we have a range of users. We have people who know I2B2 really well, have been using it for years. We have a lot of new people. And so I think that it seemed as though there is some confusion. Some people, you know, have questions. They don't know what they don't know. They may be shy to ask, but this is a good forum to ask any questions that you have. So. Anyway, uh, I'm going to let Dave take over and talk about this sheriff thing, and we can have a little discussion after that. Thanks. Hi, my name is David Wang. I'm here to present a, a I2P2 plugin called Register for Clinical Trials, and it is based on Sheriff, which is uh, created by the University of Pittsburgh team, uh, Michelle, Lisa, and Sean. So let's take a step back and look at what a clinical researcher might do if she's or if she or he is on the ACT network. Uh, on the, here I'm showing you um, on the left hand side is the Shrine ACT network. On the right hand side is the researcher's local side. She has her, her I2B2 plugin, uh, she has her uh, uh, Shrine client. Um, she starts with an idea in a clinical trial and the first thing she would do is send out a query across the network to every site and having have every site send back the number of account of patients so that she can assess well is my idea good uh is are there sufficient patients for me to start conducting this clinical trial i was really start thinking about it um are there, you know, are there ways to proceed from here eventually she gets to the point where she wants to send a local query on her, on her own I2P2, so that she can look at the patients all the identified, all the, with all the identified data and perhaps start screen, screening them. So this work is very uh, intense. It's, it's iterative. It may take tens, dozens, scores, maybe hundreds of times to get your queries just right. So for us on, on the, in the ACT network, the question is, what do we do? Now, where do we go from here? How do we disseminate our ideas? How do we uh, collab find out collaborators? How do we share the queries that we, you know, we've worked so hard to get to? To this end, the wonderful people at Pittsburgh uh, have built a, um, you can think of it as a GitHub for clinical trials, and which is called the Clinical Trial Repository. Uh, it will allow the sites in PAC to submit their clinical trials in the basic 
skeletons of clinical trial into this repository, and every site can pull from the cloud. So right now, this, this repository is not on the ground. Uh, all the sites will be able to pull from the cloud and see what everyone has submitted. And then they can share the queries, uh, share the queries that people have built. They can run those queries on their own instance. And um, so when they submit their clinical trials, the very basic information includes the type of the clinical trial, uh, who are the authors, what institution uh, are you from, uh, any documentation you might have, those may include, you know, text about the inclusion, inclusion criteria, timings, uh, et cetera. But most importantly, the queries are uh, you've built. And um, we have sort of built on top of this architecture with an I2B2 plugin that when a, uh, when a site uses the plugin to register uh, their clinical trial with this repository, a, an accompanying wiki page is created and hosted on the I2B2 community, community wiki, which allows the, uh, the authors to add additional information, such as the trial description and additional contact information. So without further ado, I'm going to walk you through what the prototype um, plugin looks like. So this is a screenshot of the register for clinical trial plugin as it sits as an I2P2. Uh, framework. It's on the right hand side. And I'm just going to zoom in just to the plugin part so it's more clear. This is a starting screen of the uh, plugin. Uh, there are four tabs on the top. We're focusing on the first tab. When you go into this tab, uh, you will pull, you contact Amazon Cloud, pull down the list of clinical trials information, and it's going to show for each trial its registration date, the title, the author, and the institution. If you are ready to uh, put forth your information and share with everybody, you will click on the new clinical trial button, which will move you to the second tab, allow you to enter your trial title. Here I put a really stupid trial title, but this is my new clinical trial, and add your author, add your institution. You can attach any files associated with this clinical trial, as many as you want, uh, by clicking the uh, choose files button. I'm going to skip that for now. What I really want to do is to drag the queries I've built and then put it into this area, which it will accept. And then um, I put a very sort of a crazy color behind it because that's really what, where the magic is. Um, when you're ready, you click on save and start discussion. All of this, now we go to the cloud. It will then, if all goes well, it will tell you if you, you succeeded, or the data goes to the cloud. And then, um, as soon as you click on OK, on the background, it's going to create a wiki page for you. So it's going to take the information you can enter here and use the template uh, to create a wiki page for you. And so to load that wiki page and move, on, move you onto the third tab of this plugin. And if you read this wiki page, you're going to see that this is the same information I, I, I have uh, entered uh, in my clinical trial. Uh, in addition, it has a prompt it prompts you to add additional descriptions for the clinical trial and input contact information if you wish. Because this is a wiki, you can just go ahead and click on edit on the top right and start editing it. Now let's go back to the first tab where now it goes again, pulls all the information from, uh, pulls all the clinical trials from uh, the repository. And you will see that my new clinical trial one is there. And suddenly somebody also created my new clinical trial too. Uh, so everybody can sort of contribute and then share with, uh, with everybody their clinical trials. You can also browse a, uh, uh, an entry that's already been there. So let's say I click on the pregnancy obstetrics uh, clinical trial. It's going to take you to this second tab. It's going to show you all the information, including the queries that the author has, has uh, entered. What you can do here is click on run query it's going to run the query in your local I2B2, and it's going to show you the result at the bottom, just like an I2B2 query. Okay. When you're ready, you can click on you know, back to register for clinical trials button, and you, it takes you back. And you know, you notice that all the fields here are sort of gray because it's in a read mode. You can click on edit to enable editing. 
Now we think this is a great way to share information about your clinical trials, not just you know, your, your descriptions, your contact information, but also the queries. Um, you can run it because it's tightly integrated in I2B2, and, and also because we are sharing the same ontology. Now, um, we believe it would be great if it could be part of the Shrine client, but uh, you know, it's not there yet. Uh, right now, I'm showing you sort of a mock-up of what could happen. Um, any questions? Um, if you have any, any ideas, I'm on, I can't stress enough, this is just a prototype. It's a very early stages, and we're trying to see if we have you know, if they see this is a, a need that they will want, this is you know something they want to have, um, ways that we can improve our implementation. Yes. Import sites. Oh, import studies. So yeah, exi existing studies that you have. That would be interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Thank you. Any more comments? Not just for this, but for the whole, you know, for the whole session so far. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to keep going here. We did not build breaks into our breakout session intentionally since we are cramming a lot in, but we understand if you need to get up. So please feel free to do so. I know the room's a little bit tight, but um, we don't actually have a planned break throughout our session. So just feel free to get up whenever you need to. But I'd like to switch over to our panel discussion here. So if I could ask our panelists, I see some of them hiding, uh, to please come up and join us here at the front of the room. We'll give them a second here. Um, but what I want to let everyone know, and, and folks joining remotely as well, we realize there's going to be a ton that our, uh, our five sites here have to share with everyone, and we know we're not going to be able to do any justice to their topics and also to addressing all of your questions in the time we have here today. So I do have a poll everywhere set up. If you'd like to go to that poll, it's open all day today and feel free to ask questions through that poll if we don't have time to address them today. And also let us know if there's other items that you'd like to see us talk about in greater detail at a future working session or fireside chat so that we can continue the conversation from some of what you'll hear from our, um, our panelists today. But we have representation from five sites. So we'll go through, and I believe the order is partners, Cornell, and then we, we will go to, I think, UNC, Pitt, and NYU. So you're going to hear from a broad spectrum of our sites some of whom joined at the very beginnings of ACT, others who more recently joined. So I'm um, excited to you know, peel back the veil of their local ACT installations. So I will turn it over to, uh, to Nick here. Again, I think this is your, your final talking point of the, of the day to talk about the, uh, the ACT installer partners. Oh. 
Five. No, I'm not. Just 14. 14. 14. Okay. I'm, everyone, each site has 10 minutes to get through their contact. No so, continue. We really need and sharing things on the panelists. <laughs> okay, I'm really actually really excited about this session um, because I want to hear from from everyone else. So I'm going to go really fast. Uh, so I just look at these just four overview things. And I think I think everyone's doing something a little different. Um, just to highlight some of the interesting things that we're doing um, at Partners. So uh, cover user registration very briefly, um, data use agreement signing, just maintaining I2P2 queries, some of the things that we're doing, and a user checker thing that we're also running. So, uh, this is what our um, user registration login system uh, looks like. This is just something that we quickly wrote. And so when um, someone wants to use the ACT, uh, oh, join the ACT network at our site, they go to a special URL, they see this, we can kind of determine if they're registered or not anyway, so they see this and they can go um, through that process. Uh, we built a self-service registration form, and so uh, anyone can go in if they meet the criteria that we've set out at our institution. They can join um, partners, users, Active Directory to manage users. Uh, the registration form that we built um, utilizes I2B2 web services exclusively, so um, it's, it's truly a self-service process, and so user accounts and their roles and their user parameters, all those things are um, automatically added into our I2B2 project manager itself. <clears throat> uh, if you want to do this at your site or think about it, um, we wrote a user, a little user guide on the community wiki about how to create a user registration app. And so this, this, this has working code in there just to show how the web service is interacting with the PM. So works. Um, data use agreement. So at our site, we decided to utilize the built-in announcements feature in the in the Shrine client. So this is, um, allows every single user to be forced to sign and accept the data use agreement every single time they log in. And if they don't, then they're redirected elsewhere. And so this is kind of what it looks like. And this is already built in into your Shrine web client. Um, so if you want to use this, we also have the details outlined on the community wiki. Uh, maintaining I2B2 queries. So this is just something that we're doing. We we're, we use SQL Server at our at our institution, and so um, as you all know, or maybe you don't know, but uh, all the queries qu query related information in I2B2 are just stored inside the QT tables in I2B2. So all this is just saying is that we have a database that's here, and this is probably a little easier to. We have a database that basically has our QT tables. And then we have, then we use synonyms inside SQL Server to um, uh, connect to all the star schema tables that I2B2 needs. So those are like the constant dimension, the oxygen fact table, et cetera. So this allows you to, during updates or um, data refreshes, we can blow away the, the main data, CRC data, without actually you know, blowing away our, our uh, QT tables and previous queries, et cetera. So this is just a technique that we use at our site. And one of the last things to highlight is just this usage checker thing that we, we, we do here. Um, a very simple daily e email report. So we so something that if sites aren't already doing, just may want to consider. Um, we have a daily e email report um, emailed out to um, our admins and just it highlights um, the various individual accounts that have run queries at um, across the ACT network that our site knows about. And um, it does some XML requests, et cetera, to various cells in I2V2 just to check that they're still up. And um, as you can see, this is just one of the, the query reports from a couple of days ago. And so this actually highlights if, if, if an individual user account has run uh, too many queries or at least something that that passes, passes the normal threshold that we've set, it flags it in this email report that at least we can um, catch it later on. All right, that's it. Thanks so much.
Yeah, so uh, welcome our medicine is uh, uh, way from side, so we are fairly new for active network, but uh, our IT between sense is uh, pretty established. We already have IT between for four years. As you can see, here's uh, some fast facts, and uh, we have three million, uh, three million patients and almost uh, three billion facts, and we're using Microsoft SQL Server. So, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of email processing, uh, we are fairly new to the whole process of ACT. So, we just wanted to show what we've done with optimizations for our ETL process. Um, in terms of ITB2, it's the same sort of uh, infrastructure that we've implemented. Um, we have SQL table partitions. We have concept dimension and observation fact, which is partitioned on the concept CD. Um, we have multi-threading in Python, um, and we have indexing of observation fact, which makes our entire process go just a little bit faster you're able to query a little bit better um and uh in terms of the actual deployment we do a backup and restore um we do lose the sequ the, the queries that from the qt query master uh but um niche had a fantastic idea of using synonyms which we may start implementing in the near future um and we have our own approach that we use at well for now for single observation pack um, with multiple projects, um, and we're using the same sort of thing here. Um, we're just pulling from that uh, main table of observation fact and transferring to the uh, to to the ACT project as well. Um, and yeah, that's that's our approach for ETLs for ACT. So uh, given the setup uh, configuration, uh, we we had some challenges. So we used Amazon Web Services uh, for Act uh, instance. So what we found out is the inbound and outbound IP address actually are different because the routing setup. Uh, we actually inbound we use the router IP address, outbound we use the net address. So, um, you know, once we set up and the query just doesn't work, so what happened? <laughs> That's what we found out. Um, we have to submit a separate firewall uh, exception request uh, to HMS get that resolved. So if you use the Amazon Web Services, that's something to keep in mind. And the other thing, uh, um, uh, particular to our side, is we used our uh, third party uh, certificate, uh, we didn't use the, um, the hub self-signed search because there's a browser, um, uh, I believe there's a browser throughout arrows, uh, security warning, and also because our, um, uh, the AWS instance actually have a load balancer in front of instance, and it requires a different format of certificate. So uh, for both reasons, we actually obtained the uh, um, you know third parties certificate and installed on our uh, environment. So how it works basically, you know, uh, lots of try, and uh, we, we figured it out it, with the help from uh, Active Team, and uh, the third party actually served at the Tom Pad level, and um, we still need the hub. Um, hub actually still have to sign our CSR and we still need to import three thirds to um, our key store just, just like what you do with the self-signed uh, cert. Um, but then your third party SSL, SSL actually needs to be imported to the HAPS repository. Um, the third thing we did is a, a little bit uh, particular to our site, it's a pretty fun query, uh, which uh, when user um, First time log on, they need to have a query topic to be able to query. Um, once they, once they um, register this query topic, they have to log out the query plan and then log back in to see that the query actually show up in the drop down list. So it's not an uh, optimized user experience. So what we did is we, we figured out actually in MariaDB, you can uh, insert a row. Um, to um, predefine some query topics for users so that when they first get in, they don't have to um, log back and uh, log back in again. 
So um, some other things, uh, you know, we found some, uh, you know, the documentation is here and there. There's uh, uh, configuration uh, shrine.com, there are some missing information, and also for shrine schema when Fiona set up, the, um, because we are using Microsoft SQL Server and uh, uh, most of the scripts are in the visible uh, SQL, um, there's the triggers and procedures we need uh, also access, uh, we need to add separately. Um, Besides the following instruction, and then some tapes uh, um, along the way, we learn it. Uh, Tomcat, Tomcat server for this uh, version actually doesn't clear the cache. So when you do the update for the configuration, it doesn't apply automatically, no matter you reboot the server or restart the Tomcat instance. So the Tomcat cache actually might need manually to, uh, to clear. And, uh, um, the other two bullet points, basically what we found out, you know, there's um, um, PM cell, when we, uh, when we log in, it actually goes to, um, it should go to the, our, um, uh, um, it's, it's actually authenticated against to PM have data, a database, which, uh, a table which pointed to our database, but if you have the, your URL cell PM path uh, didn't point to a local host, it actually will go to the harder node. Uh, the other thing is on the Shrine client, once uh, during the configuration, it's not clickable for us, and we found out it's actually because the URL in cell count uh, data is not, has a typo. So basically it doesn't throw any arrows, um, but we needed to, you know, basically we, we had to go to the log to say oh, what happened and figure this out. Yeah, so. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Robert Badger from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, so quick information about UNC. Um, we have a little bit over 1,100 users in our system now. We give pretty broad access to anyone that's willing to be tortured by about a two-hour training. Um, and uh, it's been something very important. It's a requirement we have in place for ACT access as well. Um, we've been on IT ITBD for over four years now. Um, we have data on up to 5 million patients going back to 2004. Uh, but we've seen an explosion in the last five years once we switched over to Epic and we started buying new hospitals, getting access to a lot of new data. Um, and so if you look at our kind of amount of data over time, it's kind of um, We're an Oracle shop. Um, yeah. So one of the things we've done for our local instance as well as for ACC is actually implemented this multi-fact structure that was introduced in, I believe, ITV2 version 09. Um, so we've actually, instead of just partitioning the table, we actually have broken, broken uh, observation fact out into multiple standalone tables. Um, this has had a pretty dramatic impact on our performance. Um, we were struggling with uh, some diagnosis queries that were taking even just a couple of seconds to respond uh, in the central fact table, and now it's a hundreds of seconds. Um, and we've seen some, some really great responses. Our users are a lot happier. Um, it also uh, made our ECL processes a lot easier um, because if you're trying to run an update or a delete on the central fact table, you're going to be waiting for a very long time um, just for finding the data, rebuilding indexes, et cetera. Um, so this has helped with that process a lot as well because um, we can just blow away one domain and that's and then reload it and that's it. Uh, this has required a bit more ontology management because one of the things you have to do to support the structure is you have to um, modify the uh, target column in the ontology tables. Uh, so you have to go through and update it to have the prefix of the table that needs to be queried within that domain. Um, so it's added a little bit of extra overhead there, but I mean, once you've done enough times, you have some scripts that you just run and get through, but um, and there is more index management. Each of the tables has its own index, uh, indexes. Um, and uh, you obviously have to rework all your details and I'll point to specific tables for each domain. Um, but again, we've been extremely happy with uh, making this transition. Uh, 
The other thing we've put a lot of work into is helping users build better queries. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a pretty big user base um, and we have a training, um, but training can only go so far. Uh, people will still try to do some interesting things in the web clients. Um, and ITB tool will allow users to do a lot of things that you don't really want them to do. Uh, one of them is uh, we've put a hard stop to putting duplicate concepts in. Um, so it's very easy to have things nested within the hierarchies of the ontology, and you can drag things in multiple times unknowingly, and you're not going to know that. But the application is still going to run that concept multiple times. Um, we had a case where a user somehow managed to pull in the same thing 10 different times and ran the query 10 times. Uh, so it's just a performance problem. Uh, and we also put a hard stop to adding data constraints to demographic values because we saw that when you do that, uh, it's actually querying every encounter associated with the patient, um, which you don't really need to do. Uh, so we have we have some things that we've built in, a little screenshots of uh, things we've built into the web client to also alert the users that, hey, we saw you tried to do this. You shouldn't do it. Here's why, or this is how you fix it. Um, so that we're just not stopping them from doing something for no reason. Uh, we've also put a lot of work into providing access to data dictionaries, um, some in-client help. We have these little info buttons in our ontology that you can click on. Gives you a little short little blurb on the domain you're within, but also directly links to more information within our uh, larger data dictionary that's not in the web client. Um, we're working on pulling all of these things out into a separate uh, kind of module. Um, and you're planning on posting that to our GitHub here, uh, hopefully in the next month. So if anyone's interested in looking at them, they will be out there. Uh, also, mainly so we can share it, but also to help with when we're doing code upgrades, because when you're doing a comparison of the central repo to your local install, it can get a little messy. Uh, so now it's just a bunch of single line functions that you drop into the ITV2 code and you're good to go. Uh, the other thing we put a lot of work into is medication mappings. Um, RxNorm has been getting a lot of uh, attention, uh, especially with the Cornet and now ACT's ontology being based on of it. Uh, so we've built this tool that we call S'mores. Um, and the whole point of it is to help us help sites with identifying and updating mappings to RxNorm, whether it's be from what if you have Epic, Epic will provide you with some RxNorm mappings, but updating and keeping them up to date is kind of put on the sites. Um, accuracy can be a little variable, can be very variable. Um, or if you have a whole bunch of NDC codes that don't have any mappings at all. So what this tool does is it takes whatever you have, bounces it off of uh, either the RxNav API, the OpenFDA API, uh, and we're still working on integration for the UMLS API, to basically find whatever information we can about the medic, you whatever you have locally about your medications. Um, so this has allowed us to support our storm across all the different term types. Uh, at bare minimum, get ingredients for every medication in our database, uh, so that we can support multiple arms of the ACT ontology. Um, and yeah. <laughs> So at Pit, we just have a very basic installation. We actually do not have our ITV2 um, release for our university. We'll probably do that in the fall. So we really just have an act instance right now. We have about four, four, four and a half million patients, a little over two billion facts. Um, we're an Oracle shop. We use the partitioning, but I may be switching to use part, uh, the multi-fact thing, maybe on my next ETL. Um, do you still do partitioning on this? Yeah, you have a data uh, tip. We are one hospital system, but it's about over 20 hospitals. Um, and we have three different EHR systems that feed into our, so we use Epic, Cerner, and Medivac, um, and this thing called Mars, which was a homegrown thing to feed our uh, ITV2. Other than that, I don't have anything else. Next, what is it? Oh, <laughs> so um, uh, I don't know. It, you know, it, actually, 
I, I've been a fan of I2B2 for a while. I've done different little I2B2 projects before, but it's been kind of a hard push to move our department in that way. But now that we have ACT, people are starting to see the value of it. And so, um, and, and we have some other local stuff that we'd like to include in it. So, um, you know, I'm not in charge. That's probably the best answer. <laughs> This is like actually for Pitt, this is kind of like the, our researchers first look into the EHR data, the first time they've been able to see like what type of data we have. And so we're just getting started. We, you know, we had like a manual process where people, we called it, it there was a department called CARE and now we have this thing called R3, which is in our department now, where people would submit the requests in their IRB and then you know, you tell them what kind of data, but they didn't have any actual um, hands-on, uh, they could no self-serve at all. So not, not even, they, they, you know, we would build queries behind the scene and some people would get epic data and stuff like that. So this is actually, the other thing is, this is the only um, environment where our data is all together. So most of all of our other queries, somebody was doing them all from epic, which meant it was le leaving out all of our inpatient and, um, ER data because that's Cerner and uh, Mars. So this is the first time people can get an integrated view of our data. So, yeah. all right. Well, I never heard of them. I'm a contractor who works uh, quite part time now at NYU. Running there. Um, I2B2 has been around uh, since mid 2016 uh, for NYU. Uh, there's about 7 million patients, more or less, but quite a few of those just have demographics data, no clinical data, no real encounters, you know, that sort of thing. Um, facts, uh, we've got, uh, well, as the slide says, about 900 million in, in ACT and 1.3 million to the I2B2 users. Uh, we started out and it's still that way now, a separate, it's the same hive, but a separate ITB2, local ITB2 project and a different ACT project. The ETLs are mostly shared uh, between the two. Uh, we uh, do a slipstreaming ETL so that when the ETLs run once a month, uh, the, the system's not taken down, but it runs on the same server. It just makes an observation fact view table, loads it all in with a direct path to the certs. Um, and then our downtime is really just, we take the system down, rename, you know, rename observation fact, observation fact old, rename observation fact new to observation fact, hold the string on the indexing, and we're back up. And that way we don't have to worry about any of the QT tables being blown away or any of the audit history of the users or this or that. That's all there and it's the same database. And the observation fact tables from the Oracle standpoint, uh, they're built with no logging, which means you know you don't have a lot of the the archive logs being written when you do things to these tables. With the idea being, in the case of an ultimate disaster, you can just pull the string again on the tables. You know the things that are reproducible are reproducible. There's no need to create a bazillion of kind of log tables. So we've tried to minimize the amount of sort of Oracle time and space uh, needed uh, for the ETL jobs, and you know our or each, we're down for about, well, for act because we don't do fact counting on the act side, it's maybe two hours of downtime to switch the fact tables. So from the user perspective, it minimizes downtime as well. Um, there's only a handful of act users, 260 local I2B2 users. Um, I forget the number of queries, but it's probably 14,000 or so real user queries, excluding admin types and whatnot uh, that can go in. Uh, in terms of user management, uh, there's you know, a stored procedure that goes through that somebody new wants to use the local ITB2, they do so, and we go out to the LDAP, get everything about that user, uh, bring it into ITB2, you know, throw all the switches and, and they're good to go for ITB2 uh, usage. Number of hospitals, I can't really give a good answer. In my use a big place, they took over Lutheran and I don't know how many places and you know, bucket loads of source labs and this and that that are, that are out there. So many Kindles everywhere uh, in the New York City area. Um, and it, it is Oracle-based uh, on the back end. And we're 
we're still over we're still over 12 uh, as far as i know the etls i uh, was derived you know started out kind of as heron uh, but then those we put those in as stored procedures and they run from the local job chains uh, just to uh, make it to where as we're transitioning them to local support so that's a little more approachable you know for an oracle analyst to look at the to look at the stored procedures that creates these uh, prototype type fact tables uh, and you know control all that from something like SQL developer um, and and to be able to to uh, to do it that way but it's still the same concept but just sort of localized uh, within the oracle instance um, Sam, anything else? Uh, Sam is also interesting. Uh, <laughs> uh, right. And there are two styles of metadata and the local metadata, just because I was part of the group in Nebraska for a while. So uh, we've got you know the path based path based metadata and we also have some deployed transit closure based metadata um, for this assumption or for SNOMED CT uh, is that one. So anyway, any questions? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, they, they, I looked very early on, gosh, it's been a year and a half ago or more, you know, because Epic has their set and other people may know more because my, my knowledge is from very early, uh, but Epic has its set of I2B2 things. So there's, Epic will, has a set of I2B2 ETLs that aren't, weren't fully baked when I saw that they were getting there. But yes, Slicer Dicer. Epic, you know, there's a lot of people who see Slicer, but well, why can't we use Slicer Dicer? Well, can anybody use it? Well, I don't know, but it's pretty. You know, so you you get that um, uh, back from the Epic people. But then, you know, what you know, what I've told people is that you know, ITV2 is local control. You know, it's not it's not part of Epic. You know, Slicer Dicer follows the model where it's not a central fact table. You, you know, no matter what data you have for ITV2, if you can hammer it into shape. To get into the fact table and build out an ontology, you can get it into ITV2, no matter what it is. You now, with Epic, you got Slicer and Dicer, and here's the table for meds. And I don't know, are you familiar with the Slicer and Dicer schema? Yeah, so it's a table for this and that within their domains. The last time I looked at it, it's been two years since I looked at Slicer and Dicer in the farm. But so I kind of push back when they see Slicer and Dicer, and you know, it's the sort of, it's the old Epic's going to rule everything camp versus, hey, we need some diversity in the systems here uh, to do things that Epic can't do. And there's no shrine that's an Epic shrine. You know, and that's the, that's really, if you talk about a key piece that helps answer that question, it's like, hey, but look at this, we've got shrine running, goes out to all these name brand places. Don't you, do, don't you want to be on this bandwagon too? So that's how I would answer that question. But yeah, it's, it come, you know, we hear that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, panelists. We have time for questions. Okay, you thought that we're trying to uh, use the signal now, but it's in the working progress. Trying to, there, there's a couple of institutions actually implement um, um, SSO things on. We are trying to follow their approach to see if it works. Yeah, but it's a speaking progress right now. It's still out there. <laughs> Thank you. 
procedure to go out and have to read the read the OUs for these users to get them straight um, to bring that in. Because in most places ABA was the same OU there and it was on a per user basis. So you couldn't set that parameters. Those had to be user parameters. Um, and so automate that. That's one way to do the query to bring that.
uh, for Union C, it's, it's an opt in. Um, anyone that has a valid Get Onion, which is our local user, um, has the opportunity to enroll in the training. Our training is actually posted within the university's uh, workshop list. Um, so it's available at all times for you to sign up for it. Um, we maintain a separate training environment um, just in case someone decides to go in and do some information. Uh, it doesn't affect production or anything like that. Uh, but we set them up with a training account. And they have, uh, I think, it's about six months to complete it. Most people complete it within a week. Um, and if we make them take a little test at the end, uh, just to make sure that they actually did the thing that they are supposed to be doing. Um, our training is entirely online. It's all videos, uh, step-by-step instruction. Um, and once they complete the training, uh, now with ACT, they have the opportunity to request access to ACT as well. Um, but we do make that a requirement because we don't want you all to be doing our users submitting a query. Um, going out to so many sites. And that's something we're kind of concerned about is uh, being these queries that are going to be bogging down our system. Um, so we have administrator that gets a notification when they submitted the test, and they completed it, their onion, have a uh, little button, we have a little spec, uh, custom spot, we have a little that, we type in an onion, make sure that it's real and checks against our active directory, and then automatically adds it to our uh, production project. For now, we have something similar. Uh, we have various ways a user can get access. We do have online training and we do have monthly at this point uh, workshops. And I can speak to that a little bit more. Uh, but basically, uh, if the user shows up and, and they ask for access, uh, we'll train them a little bit. We'll give them sample queries and then we'll we'll give them access. Um, we've done both the manual and the automatic automated way of provisioning account access. Um, manual seems to be a lot slower with Hundred users versus one, but the automated still is a work in progress, so we're working on that. Um, overall, it's uh, we're actively, I think, the best way to put it is we're actively trying to get people to use the system, and we're we're screaming from the rooftops that hey guys, there is is a tool available. Come um, check it out. As I think, we have a long time, a long time since you know our our enthusiasm. The effort with recording it um, and, and the natural desire to bring some access to have people using it all the time. And the other hand, really, that's what we might want to do. I'm sure I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not
probably part of it is they haven't had so much exposure with that all they know, right? The diagnosis. But perhaps over time, as they really want to be more interested, stuff is available that they really start to die. But right now, the questions are just that we have this stuff that we have yet to imagine. Other questions for our panelists before moving? Sure. So right now, just to provide some clarity on, on the um, selection of a query topic, from a governance standpoint, the purpose of having that query topic is so that the data steward can do his or her job, right? So that they can see who it is that's using the tool for what purpose. And it also is nice for us from a central standpoint. It is one of the questions that we ask with our monthly act metrics just to gain an understanding as to how people are actually using the tool. Um, so right now it is, I believe it's default, trying team, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's automatically approved when an investigator goes to create a query topic. Um, there's some pros and cons with that. Uh, hopefully it's helpful to have that for the data, data steward to do their job, but at the same time, it's also, and I'm guilty of this, my only query topic I've ever created is act test query. So you can't really tell what I'm doing, right? Since I'm using that that only topic really because I'm, I'm lazy, right? I'm not going to create a separate topic and especially I'm not a real user. So it works for me, but users might run into the same situation. So from a governance standpoint, we don't specifically state anything about the tool itself in the creation of a query topic. It's really just that we want the data steward to have some ability to monitor query activity and ensure that it's being used for ACTA guidelines and there's no malicious intent of someone going in there and trying to reverse engineer things to see if they can actually identify someone. Um, so I do think there's room to talk about other ways to do that and perhaps it's not through you know, create, creation of a query topic or, you know, going through it in that process. I don't know if the Shrine team, if there's some other considerations with Shrine 2020 for creation of a query topic, um, but I do know that's something when training end users that can be a little bit difficult to go through from a training end since it is, you know, they have to log in, it's a different screen and they must create that topic before they can actually run their first query. Uh, so understand that it's certainly a, a user consideration, but um, from the governance standpoint, again, you know, that's the nice thing. There really, if things change from a technical standpoint, there's not much to change. The only thing that governance cares about is that there's some way to monitor query intent. No, it's not creating the new topic. It's that when you click request new topic, you get the new window, you create the new topic and everything, and when you click save, and you go back to the original window, you have to re-log in. Yeah, to Exactly. If it came back, and if you came back to the original screen and the topic was there, that wouldn't be a big issue because we would say that you have to do this. But it's the fact that they have to re log in again. They're like, oh, okay. they don't really yeah. 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 And something too, we do have a few of those simple act videos, um, how to videos on the website that our dissemination team did a great job pulling together. I don't think it actually addresses that component of having to log out and log back in. Did you? Okay. Oh, 
Okay, and if not, could be a good opportunity for us to do that. I'm not sure how many of you are pushing out those videos to end users when you roll out, or if you're creating your own sort of guidelines and tools, but you know, at least in the near term, uh, it's one of those just little minor education things, right? That hopefully uh, will save folks a lot of uh, discontent with the tool, at least in the near term. Time for one more question for the panel before we move on to our final session. All right. Thank you guys for your questions. Thank you so much to our panelists. All right, folks, we have about, we're going to go till 10 till the top of the hour to allow enough time to transition uh, before Griffin session at four o'clock. But I want to spend the rest of our time together today going through some data harmonization components, specifically around planning and process, more so than the actual content as far as what goes into the ontology. Although if we have some time, I think we can uh, we can focus a little bit on that as well. But before we get started, who, by show of hands, participates in our data harmonization work group? Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> I'm going to put the plug. If you don't participate in our work group and you're interested in doing so, it's open to anyone and everyone who's interested. We meet monthly on the first Monday of every month from 2 to 3 Eastern. So if you're interested in joining, let me know. Um, and I also, I don't think any of those will be offended if you tune out this session if it's not of interest to you. Although I do hope if you have anything to relay back from your institution, even if you don't participate in the work group or actually work with the ontology yourself at your site, um, you can still relay any info to me. And folks, anyone still joining us remotely, as we go through this, I have a few questions for you. I know you can't hear well from the audience in the room, but please send me uh, an email with any comments that you'd like to share. So we go through this in our um, in our work group meeting, but I did want to provide an opportunity for folks who don't participate in our work group meeting, or if there's any other comment before we put this thing to bed and really focus fully on the future. Um, it's just about our ontology version 2.0.1 rollout that was in April this past year. It was a beast. I'm sure all of you can recall, even if you didn't do the install, you were likely affected by it as a as a user at some component but would love to hear any other comments related to what went well in the process what was a challenge i know to give an example of a challenge um, you know we had some input later in the process so we made some additions right prior to our go live date with that ontology so i know that that was tough um, but other comments on challenges or anything that went well with that rollout. Five seconds or else for Everculture Peace and we're done talking oh. about 2.0.1. <laughs>
couldn't make it one giant clip. I couldn't figure out. But anyway, yeah, but that's, the that's only okay. thing is, is that this may not even be a problem anymore because I was just in that other session with Mike Mendez. Where'd he go? And he said he has a GitHub and he put the act ontology on for the new thing and it's all zipped up as one thing. He has scripts and everything that will install it just as it does if you do um, the original, you know, like the demo data ontology in, um, in I2D2. So if this is true, this doesn't matter anymore. I'm super happy and he says it does it in all three places. This is what he said. That's what he said. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly do not know if you do So anything I do is a burger is very suspect. So I try not to mention it. That's first. I don't even know anyone who uses Postgres. So that is the second problem. So all I can do is Oracle and Spirit, which that doesn't always work because there's all these different symbols that are in the so, so that's why we have all these variations, but this may not be a problem. I wish Mike was in here because I swear to God he said that you download it. He has a stored procedure or something that will install uh, here. So he has it all in one zip and he says he puts everything in. But that's a good point. I mean, the, our rollout traditionally, I think we've shared box links with one individual too, which has been tough. We, yeah, especially with the size. Yeah. And our, our wiki, there's, that's going to be a separate conversation. We have some other things to modify with, um, with the wiki as well, but size limitations are tough, but it's, you know, it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we can. So that may not be an issue. I'm hoping that Mike Mendez has solved this installation problem for all of us, where he has something like a one stop shop, but it said it will download the zip, it installs it, and it also does some kind of checks and all this other stuff and runs your C code. Good, so we're done. Conversation. <laughs> We have it, you're right. In the aftermath recently, there's different fights had, you know, there's different like, these 10 hierarchies and a lot of fights with turning counts for one and not the other. And I think part of that was coordinating the process across different ways, and that will potentially still be an issue for the group. So thinking about right. How, when different sites are coming on in relation to what's being released, to make sure that everyone has the right thing to do steps. Sometimes, you know, might be starting at different points, and that would be challenging. Thank you. 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 I think the other thing was is that it was additive, so implemented. Right. Right. Yeah. And that was because there was a lot of pain for that very first ontology. And I just really didn't have the heart to make people read all those tables, thinking that, oh my God, this is not a problem. So I'm trying to limit the read level of stuff that was painful in the first place. I, I made it additive. And we also had this weird thing where we were making these little changes. So and we didn't want to disrupt this and that, you know, but really, I, I mean, in hindsight, I really think we should just drop the whole thing under anybody who doesn't know what the process is. There were like a few one-off pre that I don't think would be common. Yeah, and there's a lot of people that are Sites. Hopefully, no one's scared and running. It's going to get easier for you. 
before we talk a little bit more about the future on our current process, just to set the stage for what we did with this large rollout and anything um, prior, I believe, I think before um, I was even part of the network, but the ontology is loaded onto the ITV2 demo server. So this is accessible via the app wiki and we shared it out to the data harmonization work group. And the thought it's, it's been informal, right? So go to the demo server, take a look at it, let us know your feedback, any thoughts, comments, whatever. It's tough with all of the large changes that were pushed out this last time. And it's time consuming. It's hard to identify the way that we did it. You know, what else has changed? What's different? What's new? Um, but that's been the process to date. We've asked for feedback during the data harm work group. The ontologies go through the test process with the ACT test network, which is, as a reminder, just the four um, I believe still just the four main sites, right? Network. And you see it, yeah, okay, okay. I think maybe we have five now, yay. If anyone's interested in joining the test network, you're always welcome to do so. But we asked the test network to go through, install the files, report back with any issues, um, uh, any errors in, you know, or typos, anything along those lines. And then we deployed it to stage and production networks. Yeah. Anyone has a question about the test network? Sure. We're working on doing some sandbox work with, uh, data from synthetic events. And is that something that we could we can plug into this test network to see for the time? You mean the data? Yeah. To go with? Yeah. We just wanted to see if the operations were the one. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just we just have to make sure ITV doing a thing that is open to the public. But you know now it just has a demo the test data we want to put it in the well, our idea is to get some better data. It's all synthetic data. So this is a product out of they call this thing called Cynthia. And they, they feed a demographic and they're creating application uh, data. I don't know, feed a child with a lot of patients. Because it's that's the one line you know. So they created a version for Massachusetts. Um, so it's called synthetic data. We want to provide that over three instances of what the same box federated network can be. Anyway, it's all data that we have. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. Thoughts from network ops? Any reasons why that might be tough for us in test? Um, well, I mean, no, this, this one actually isn't on test. Oh, 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 you mean this demo server or the, the actual test network? Okay. But I guess we hypothetically like, could hook this up to the shrine. Well, I think to some degree, and make it a separate node. What's being described is similar to QA requirements and data, and that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to any aspect of the app network to work with all the same functionality and shrine. All we want to do is, is build our own little train network. Um, so what we've been doing is it's collaborative with the CPC. And if you can see the CPC is actually going to help some of the staging practice on the CPC. What we'd like to do is make sure we get everything right <laughs> um, and test it. Before. So that's our current process. Maybe it works well for really, really simple bug fixes or minor updates to the ontology, but uh, we've realized that not only are there more smooth processes that we could follow for future deployments of the ontology, but we could certainly do a better job of gaining everyone's insight, anyone who's interested in playing with these files or contributing their thoughts to future versions of the ontology. So this is the last slide that I have to review uh, today. And really, I just want us to talk openly about uh, selfishly, three three questions here, but anything else too related to the process. My goal for this would be to take some sort of a process map to the next data harmonization work group meeting, which is coming up. I think it's July 
first, so a week and a half, two weeks from now. But a couple of things. We want everyone to be able to contribute what goes into the ontology, and we've set up a Google Sheet for that. I don't want to go into detail here. We've discussed it in our work group meetings. So who tests the ontology before release? Is it just the test network? Do we want other sites to, well, of course, we want other sites to continue to join the test network, but if you don't, or if you have, you know, a separate, um, a separate non-production node that you're willing to play with some things for us, you know, do you want to participate? But we need volunteers who will actually look at it, provide us feedback before we ever get to the point where we set dates for deployment and stage and production. So whether that's through the work group or if there's subgroups in the work group. So ultimately, how can we as a data harmonization work group contribute to the development and rollout of the ontology most effectively? Now, that is just one component of what the work group does, right? I mean, we've talked a lot about data characterization and some thoughts, too, for how to move forward with that. But specifically today, I, I want us to focus on the ontology. So open to any and all ideas so that we can set up a, a more effective structure for contributing to the ontology development itself and then testing it out before we roll it out more broadly. I guess that, like, what is testing? Yeah. So we had reached out to nodes connected to the staging network and asked that they go through, load it onto their staging node before we turn to the rollout in production. I think it was only maybe two weeks before the rollout date in production. Maybe a month. The original date. Okay. Nobody had put it on staging until about a month. The goal of staging is essentially done. It's been fully tested. Right. Yeah, so I think part of the problem is, is convincing people to do that, right? Like they got so much other stuff to do, it's like, oh, we need to the quality bikes, basically. So I think we have, you know, there may have been one or two who did it, but the rest were like, I'm just going to roll the bike. Well, I guess one thing that happened during the, during the stage install is we were came up that I think had to do with the car and that's when uh historical code as we hear around speed and came up with mm -hmm. staging. And oh, part of that is right, so we only have four to five sites on the test network, they might discover some issues, but is there you know, is there a way for additional input outside the test network? Earlier, and that's part of that hoop, but that's where there were issues that came up late when sites were doing it. Ideally, for that. I think how many people actually put it on stage? And it's tough too, in terms of like, yeah, it, it's, it's dual purpose, right? So it's for your non production node and then at the same time it's also for our it's a true staging hub for our sites that are just joining the network so you have some nodes on there 
that only have demo data or you know don't even have the actual ontology at all installed yet which i think is our way of by process we're asking that folks do that even if they don't have the data to, to support it before coming onto stage two so it's i think it's a little bit tough because it serves multiple purposes so yeah it's it's tough but something too perhaps if i mean if and if it's something that you're interested in and i guess this comes down to depending on the changes and what needs to be if it's backwards compatible or not so if you could use your staging node to test the ontology well in advance and be one of our tech people so just join our test network <laughs> always looking for for folks but um so how can we break it down? So should we break it down like by domain and the support people on each domain and then by installation, which is another thing that they do with that Twitter, right? The installation instructions and all that stuff. So there's like right. do we assign specific people to people's specific jobs instead of saying test? Because clearly when you say test, people are like yeah, basically, right? Right. Wait, we're developers, we need testing. And I think this is something that we kind of can bring from a little here and also flush out an additional tabs in the Google Sheet um, with the data farm is identifying those different areas where something is required and then uh, finding those. Uh, But generally pretty stable with the exception of stuff testing So that helps a little bit with, with recapping. So 
things that we still have to, you know, we can build out on the Google sheet and identify who's willing to test what and where, but, you know, the, the main component, better understanding what it is we're looking for when testing, like Philip brought up. And I love the idea of a decision tree. I think that makes it pretty clear and simple depending upon what it is that's changing or being added or um, updated there to then understand, you know, the path forward and what it is we'd be looking for uh, during that testing process. Other thoughts? Some of the testing automation or folders that have to show the So there's that sort of thing. Half, just half the show. But the trunk of the trunk of the trunk of To folders with no children, or you know, things that don't have parents at all. Yeah, and then we don't. I don't know if that was a problem. Well, maybe it wasn't because it all came out clean for the end of the That was, but I think it's that will probably be based in the happen. Is us figuring out the data formalization, figuring out the process, take this stuff and actually um, implement it into a regular um, working. Yeah. It's a bigger group to have that conversation, but maybe that's where we take our all of them and make them more actively working at the top of the group and build out the process. Our meetings have been more conversational than documentation based, and I think that can strengthen the frame of our certainly. Excellent. Well, thanks everyone. If you are interested in learning more or participating in the work group, um, send me an email. I will be distributing these slides. Uh, later today or tomorrow, the link to the Google Sheet is there. Um, it's really an opportunity to add anything you're interested in seeing in future versions of the ontology. It's meant to be a workspace, so we really hope that uh, it's used that way and it's not just us filling it out, but that you, you know, take the opportunity to add things there too. Uh, so if nothing else, it's at least out of your head and on paper and somewhere for the rest of us to discuss and see how it fits in with the future. So um, thank you, appreciate that. And thank you all so much for being here this afternoon and spending your time with us to talk about all things ACT. So I just wanna remind you of the Poll Everywhere survey that's available. It's just, I'm asking for your email address and then two questions. Another opportunity in case you had questions that weren't addressed here or you think about something whenever you leave today. And then also keep us posted on areas that you'd like to dive deeper into. So we posted webinars last year, a series of informational webinars. We've done these sessions here um, at the symposium, but we'd love to move more towards interactive sessions, whether they're fireside chats or uh, workshops of some sort that's dedicated to one particular area. So we all have a lot of knowledge here to share and we're looking for better ways to do that than just the same ones of us standing up here talking to all of you. So thanks to everyone for participating and our panelists and uh, those of you joining remotely. I'll follow up with an email, but I'm uh, excited to see all of you and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks everyone.